to speak the truth frankly and boldly. Hey there to everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am so delighted to have a chance to talk with Anatolio. I am excited about the work he's been doing. I'm excited about the um, the research he's been doing and the insight he's developing. And I really think that what we're gonna learn and talk about today is so unbelievably crucial. Anatolio, uh, this is completely wonderful, but as a human living in Southern Ohio on a gray, rainy day, what the heck is the story with where you are? Because it is gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, looks may be a, a little bit deceiving. It is, in fairness, it is gorgeous. Uh, however, I had to make a, a lot of, I had to improvise this morning. Uh, I was told, I, I don't even know how the quality of my communication is. My my wife is on a business video call. My kids are doing online learning, so they're all streaming, probably in high def. I don't know what the bandwidth is I have available to me, but I got kicked out of where I needed to be because I gave it up for my kids. So I am actually on the roof of my house right now. It's, it's, it's and frankly, uh, you know, I haven't worn a collared shirt. I thought this would be special. I haven't worn a collared shirt in a month. Um, but I need this jacket on because it's cold. Now it, it'll get warmer. It's California in the afternoon. It'll be warmer. I'm freezing right now and I'm on the roof. It, you can see that's actually there. That is my roof and you can't quite see, but over there is my chimney. Uh, this is certainly one of the um, most dangerous interviews I have ever done in my life. Um, I, I'm literally on the edge. If I move my chair back even just a little bit, let me see if I move my chair back a little bit. No, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 just uh, and scene. No, um, no, but I, I, I kid you not. I am, I am uh, inches away from uh, this being my last interview. Please tell me that you're on something that's flat. Ish. I'll, I'll tell you if that's what you want me to tell you. <laughs> <sighs> all right. And I forgot one thing. Wait, just keep talking. I can hear you. Oh my you. God. So I set all of this up and um, uh, my my son came out here and he said, Dad, you're dumb. Um, <laughs> which, uh, in fairness, may be true. Anyway, we shouldn't talk about this is, I think, just all part of the, the new normal. <laughs> so, um, so we improvise and we do the best we can with the current situation. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. So, so off we go. And tell you, you win the internet today. Uh, All right. That's that. I don't even know how to go on from that. Dad, he's never said, Dad, you're dumb before, though, right? <laughs> like, he's never had to say that. Well, well, and, and, and my wife told me, please don't fall off the roof. So, anyway. I, I'm on your wife's let's, side this time. Let's, so let's talk economic development. Okay. You're not allowed to move. Capisce? Okay. All right. So, you know, we have had some great conversations over time. Um, I've, I've always incredibly loved your insight and your um, just your your ability to kind of understand the undercurrents of what's going on. And I thought it would be great if we talked today, um, particularly starting with where we are now, because, you know, we are where we are now, our, you know, new normal, quote unquote, which for most of us does not involve sitting on the roof of our house, God willing. Um, oh, look, he can even take a drink while he's up there. It's, uh, this is all kinds of impressive. Um, so we wanna talk about the present situation and kind of the, the very um, accelerated change that's going on, particularly for folks who work with organizations that address economic development in whatever manner that they do. But we also want to talk about it as as, a, as an indicator, as a component, as, as a continuation with where we're probably going post pandemic. And as I've said on a few things lately, I really think that what we're encountering is an acceleration of trends that we've seen develop over the last many years. So we've known that business retention 
and expansion, and I have to be careful with that because I have a Freudian slip that we'll talk about later. Um, when it comes to to saying that term, but when it in, in the terminology for those of you who are not economic developers is B R and E. So when we say B R and E, that means the work that economic development people do to strengthen existing businesses, so retain existing businesses, and also to help them expand when the opportunity pr presents. So. I, you know, we try not to use a whole lot of jargon, but that's one that I'm sure is going to slip in, and it's BRNE. BRNE means business retention and expansion. Okay. So, as we're looking at this acceleration, um, and starting with the, the present moment, obviously, you know, from talking to economic developers, and Anatelio, you talk to folks who work in economic development all over the country, and I believe at this point all over the world. You, you're you seeing and hearing things. Uh, and I think it's important to wonder for us to think about, there's a, there's a public health crisis, it's causing economic devastation. What do economic developers need to be thinking about and doing right now in this, in this very moment? So, I, I mean, there's, there's a variety of things that I think are, are really quite important to what we're hearing from economic developers. But I think that two that we have to pay particular attention to is one, this issue of focusing on the most vulnerable communities or, or segments of our communities. And the second one is focusing on the existing businesses. So let me uh, talk about each of those just a little bit. Mm -hmm. The first is not everybody is getting impacted by this the same way. So one of the, the sayings that a lot of people say is, we're all in this together, right? And kind of we are, but we're experiencing this very different ways. Some people are at home and they're functionally, they're so wealthy, they're really more on vacation. And then there are people who are suffering. They're suffering economically. They live paycheck to paycheck. And by the way, that's a lot of people, not just in the United States, but the whole world. Uh, I think one of the last statistics I saw was that by end of April, so so yesterday, yeah, half of people's savings are supposed to be completely exhausted. So what does that mean to have actually no money? So I think what economic developers and pu public policymakers need to think about is how do we support these people who are absolutely on the edge right now? And, and this goes from the people who don't have health care for the people who don't have the protections of having a job. Maybe they're gig workers or they're hourly workers. These are already the people who are most marginal and potentially most at risk. Yeah. The, the, the second part of that is about the local businesses, because the local businesses are what makes every economy go. It's what employs the local residents. It's what creates the taxes that help fund government and you know the police and fire and the roads. So, so this is another area that is just absolutely important. And what the research that we are seeing uh, and what we've collected have shown is, is that actually economic developers are really focused on local businesses right now. Yes. The concern is, is are we making sure that the most marginal people in our communities are also um, saved? No, I, that's that's really excellent to hear and to hear you talking about. Um, yeah, the, the numbers, there's lots of numbers that are floating around, but they've been very consistent um, and this is going back 20 years with regard to the percentage of employment that is created by local small businesses, the percentage of reinvestment um, through the work that I've been doing with Amoeba, the American Independent Business Alliance. You know, there's exhaustive information in that with that organization talking about the local multiplier effect. So all of this stuff really to an extent, we knew all of this, but we haven't really put it into practice. And I really hugely appreciated bringing, you know, the 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 individuals, the humans who are who are most at risk into the conversation here, and not saying, "Oh, that's somebody else's problem," which so often is what people in economic development 
sometimes we have, an, have a, a tendency to want to kind of segment that that's somebody else's job to take care of that. Well, there's a risk in economic development that we just treat business as an abstraction, as if it's a company and this is a, some theoretical unit. But really, businesses are people. They are the owners. They are the workers. And so there is definitely a human element to this. And I think that that's where economic developers need to be. Um, we, we need to show empathy uh, because it's it's the right thing to do. Empathy's hard. Empathy is scary. Empathy means having to say, I don't know, and I can't fix it. And, and look, we're not going to have all of the answers to this is a big problem. And most of the economic developers that I work with are uh, at the state and the local or regional level, uh, less so at the national, although we do work with some national organizations also. Mm -hmm. But um, they're, they don't have all of the levers that they need to be able to solve these problems. Yeah, yeah. Which makes it all the harder sometimes when we've come mm -hmm. up in an expectation of, I'm supposed to say, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. I'm from the agency, I'm here to help you. Mm -hmm. And when we have to say, I don't know, I think that, that yeah, that's a very, very different environment. Um, one of the things that I think is also really interesting in what you said is that when we talk about small businesses and we talk about populations that are at risk, that are um, overexposed in this in this situation, that also in, those those are not mutually separate audiences. Those are very often the same people. The person who runs the local auto body shop who's African-American may have very little to no savings to fall back on. And, you know, it's not, those aren't two, two, you know, separated issues. They really do fit together. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's really a, a in some respects a, a powerful, I would argue a sea change in how we think about the role of economic development. And like I said before, I think that's been coming. Um, but what do you think is coming for, for people who do economic development work after this, this crisis is resolved, after we have a vaccine, after, you know, we have, we have whatever our new normal is? Well, um, <clears throat> So some some odd and very unintuitive things happen during recession. Like we were, I mean, all the ec economists are saying we're going to have a recession if we're not already in a recession, just that the data isn't there to yet show it. So the the issue of creating jobs or jobs in general is going to be very, very difficult. So, <clears throat> and I think a big trend is gonna be automation. Why is this going to happen? Because it's 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 a little bit counterintuitive because you would think, okay, there's very high unemployment, so there's going to be, um, it'll decrease wages, right? So right. why would you go to automation if the cost of labor is now cheaper, right? That That's intuitive. But what actually happens is, is that for the businesses, their revenue goes down so quickly that the relative cost of labor, right? Because they used to have this much, so it was a smaller portion. But mm -hmm. if it decreases, the relative cost of labor is now much higher. So what does that mean? That means actually in economic bad times, businesses are going to double down. They're going to really focus in on automation. So, and and, and the data shows this from the last three recessions. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, it, it doesn't, it's not the first thing that you think will happen, but every time that we've come out of recession, there's been a big focus on automation, whether it's software or robots or whatever that situation is. And who gets hurt by this? Who the people are who lose the jobs is very clear. It mm -hmm. is the most marginal groups. It is the people who, whose jobs are most easily automated. And so these are some of the people who have lower incomes, less education levels. But but for people who think that they're going to be able to save their job or their industry is going to be protected because they have a college degree, 
that's that's not the case. This, I think it, it's just becoming wider and wider in terms of who are impacted. So for economic developers or investment promotion agencies who are measured on this metric of job creation, they're also gonna be in a very difficult position because how do you create jobs in a situation where automation is so powerful? Uh, kind of related to that issue is this issue of there's this decoupling of, um, of GDP from, from jobs. Like GDP yeah. keeps going up, right? Um, mm -hmm. but, but the jobs that, um, but the jobs aren't necessarily, like you can just get so much more productivity, what, either out of a person or a person that's, that's aided by software or robot right. or whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those things are, you can have an, an economic recovery, and I, I will kind of say that as loosely, um, because again, the question is recovery for who, right? Yeah. Um, so you can have increase of, of productivity without the increase of people. And this is a, this is a, when, if you actually drill down into the data, you look and you go, gosh, there's all these metros that over the last few years um, or, or last couple of decades, have had so much uh, economic growth. But then you look at, well, what was the actual impact of all of this growth on median wages or average yeah. wages? And, and there hasn't been an increase. In fact, some of the most economically robust places in terms of output, economic output, mm -hmm. income has gone down. Yes. So, so I think that these trends are going to accelerate in ways that we as economic developers have to be prepared for. How would one prepare for that? I mean, that's that's a that's a profound change. It, it, do, you it have is. A sense of, do you have a sense of what being prepared for that looks like possibly at this point? And I know we're getting into, you know, sort of crystal ball land here. Yeah, so I'll just give three uh, quick answers. Uh, all of these actually just, I, I wrote a piece for FDI Intelligence Magazine uh, somewhat recently about this. And the short version is this. One, there needs to be transitioning of work and people need to be reskilled. Um, so that's the first thing. The second is, is that regions, economic regions, cities, where whatever the, the areas that you serve as an economic developer, they need to be on the winning side of of the tech transition, and you know. And the question is, can everybody be a winner? So, because what happens is, is if you are not a region that is innovative and has tech behind it, your region is going to be left behind. You are going to be the have-nots of the future economy, and that's that's challenging, especially challenging for rural communities. Uh, if you're a rural community and you don't have access to broadband, it, it's, not a, it's not a good future. So, and then the third thing is, is that the entire physical structure of what our landscape looks like today was not based on a world of increased automation. So think about the, um, the drive-through that you go to, where you go to get your oil change, getting gas and all. I'm just talking about car things, right? Because cars are getting automated, right? The, the, the driverless car, what is the impact on that? Well, do I, need an, do I need a Lyft driver or an Uber driver if the car drives itself anyways? There's just, these all have significant impacts. Mm -hmm. So city planners and economic developers have to get together because the physical landscape itself has to change. You know, that's that's fascinating. And, you know, both you and I have um, academic backgrounds in urban planning and work experience in economic development. So it, it's always fascinating to talk to folks who 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 tie those pieces together. So you mentioned the writing that you've done for FDI um, and your writing when you post on, whether it's on LinkedIn, it's on FDI, it's on a variety of other sources, you're always very insightful and you always have a very deep grounding in data, in both practical data, um, and it's all practical, but in quantitative data and in case studies. Don't move, you're scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, so you put out a new white paper. I believe it hit the streets yesterday. If, yeah. if I if I got that correctly, okay. and I was privileged to get a uh, an advanced copy and went through it pretty carefully, and it's it's completely just jammed to the gills with really good information, and it covers the gamut of issues associated that some of the, what we've talked about, and some of what I think we're probably going to talk about as we we get a little more brass tacks here in the next few minutes. Well, can you give folks an overview of that white paper, um, what the purpose of it is, and kind of what your your key findings or what surprised you or, or what you thought was particularly insightful coming out of that? So there were two things that we wanted to do with the, the white paper. And for anybody who's interested, you can download it for free at, at sizeup.com. So the first thing is, is that... Um, we just wanted to understand what's going on. Because if someone, somebody asked me, oh, Anatolio, that you're in contact. I mean, I talk to a lot of economic developers. I work with a lot of them. I have a lot of friends all around, not just the US, but around the world. But if you ask me, it's just gonna be my opinion. And so what I'd rather do is I'd rather learn from economic developers what they're experiencing so that we can all see what's happening to our profession. So that was the first thing is we just wanted to know what's what's happening. The second issue is, is that I, I've been hearing so many economic firms saying, well, what can we do? How can we solve this? And there's a lot of smart things that economic developers and businesses are doing to respond to better save companies, jobs, and the, the economies of communities. So what we have is we have 10 really interesting case studies of mm -hmm. what can be done by economic development. Yes. So in addition to the case studies, there's a survey. And I just want to touch on the survey before we talk about the case studies. And I went and grabbed my, you know, highly, somewhat environmentally responsible <laughs> print in black and white. Um, but I did print it because I'm old. Um, the, um, let's talk a little bit about, before we get into the case studies, let's talk a little bit about the survey first, the survey results first. So you did a survey in this. Can you tell us a little bit about who you surveyed and um, kind, of, kind of what you heard um, at a high level coming out of the survey responses? Because yes. we certainly want people to read this. Yeah, so uh, I want to be specific. This is a survey of United States economic developers. So the so um, results may vary depending on what country you're in. This is this may be different in Canada or if you're um, in Europe or Asia or Latin America, whatever the situation is. I'm speaking about data for for the U.S. So one of the one of the biggest findings is there's been a massive pivot in economic development in terms of what focus is, and it's 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 so big that everything else kind of doesn't even register. So um, in terms of the highest priority, what economic developers said is most important to them now, 80, basically 87% said assist local businesses. Yeah. Now that is, I don't think that that is, well, it's not that I don't think, that the data would show that that wasn't in the past such a concentration for economic developers, right? Because how are we experiencing the crisis? We are experiencing the crisis at a very local level. And economic developers, the elected officials, the, the local businesses are our economy. I, I don't know any other way to say it. Like this is what drives all of the things that we want to happen in our communities. So that's the next most important thing at 4.3% is assist laid off workers. Okay, you and said, wait a minute, you said 4.3? Yes, so basically you're talking about number one is 87% of the priority. And then the second most important thing is 4%, but it's still interesting because assist laid off workers, I would say is probably something that 0% of economic developers did before this. And it's now the number two. So, but in fairness, it, it barely registers. Yeah. Wow. 
And you know, it's it's interesting because the the training which you've done economic development training um, for IEDC, I've I've done it for IED, and you've done it for like a zillion organizations, but um, I've done it for a few as well. And the the language has always been business retention and expansion is very important and it's very important and it's very important and we need to be doing it and you know etc 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 but it has um i i mean and i'll i'll be blunt is that i i think a lot of times that has been honored more in the breach than in the doing you know because it has been something that is difficult for people to do, especially if you came to economic development from a sales or a marketing background, which is to me one of the fascinating things about people who work in economic development is they come to it from, you know, a hundred different career paths. And to see that pivot, and I've picked up on, you know, I haven't done the kind of research that you have, but to the degree, you know, I've done a lot of listening and, and talking and hearing, and I'm hearing the same thing. And it's extraordinary how intense that um, that shift has been. What's wrong? But but we haven't done BRE very well in the past. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about what you've seen? Because I know this has been a really particular area of focus for you and reading for example your articles on linkedin um going back a year two years it's, it's there's a huge amount of insight on how exactly the things that we've said to do work and don't work um and again bring your very empirical very data-driven background to it what are you what have you seen his, historically in the way that we've done business recruitment and business i see now here's the interesting thing i mentioned the freudian slip before Freudian. Yeah. Slip. i just did it we are so used to economic develop economic i could say that too to talking about attraction recruitment etc that even though my life has mostly been on the side of how do we build local businesses i still slip all the time and say that wrong business retention and expansion. I think it's telling that even I'm saying it wrong. But as we've done business retention and expansion, what have you seen that hasn't been effective historically, meaning pre-coronavirus? The, how you had your, whatever you call your, your Freudian slip or whatever, it's a it's a longer conversation, which is not for for right now, but there's a lot of inertia, and there is tradition in the profession, and I think that we just always have to question tradition to see if it makes sense for what we need right now. I so my background, I worked in local economic development. I did business attraction. I also did business retention and expansion. I did Main Street programs. I did redevelopment all of these types of things. I did downtowns. And one of the things that I experience, and I imagine a lot of people who work in, in BRE work experiences is that there aren't all of the levers that we would like to really be able to be helpful. And I used to go out into, I would do the tradition because this is what I was told when I came into the profession. Sorry, I just have to move this table or I am going to either. <clears throat> I know there's there's a risk. Uh, but a I, risk. I just don't want to be a witness. If I move forward, that I at least avoid skin cancer. So I so I go out on my BRE surveys because that's what we were told. You're new to the profession. What business retention and expansion is, is you do a survey. You go out, you meet with these businesses. But it was the case you, you brought this up. It's the hi, I'm the government, I'm here to help. And what could we actually do to help? Because some of these businesses, certainly businesses today, they're having problems making payroll. You think they're really gonna have that conversation, not just now, but anytime with somebody from the government? 
they're probably not going to have that conversation with a, a business colleague or maybe not even their spouse or whatever the case is. So, so those types of problems, like we're not that well equipped to solve. Now, if you need a curb cut or you need some type of change of zoning so that it's a retail space, but you want to move it into services, absolutely. Those are things that we can do well. But coming out of so many of those interviews, they're just there were a lot of things that we couldn't do. And, and here's another problem is, is that sometimes people associate business retention and expansion with small business. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that is correct because most of us in economic development, we're in organizations that are short staffed. I've been in community, I've served communities of 7,000 people. I've served communities near a million people. I've been in ones of around 100,000. And guess what? It seems like the staff size is always the same. It's too few people. So, so what do economic developers do? Well, what we do is we say, okay, if we have limited time, who are we going to serve? Guess who that is? That is going to be the biggest employers. That is going to be the fastest growing businesses. Mm -hmm. So, it, and it's, it's not the economic developer's fault. It is just an issue of being practical, which is you have limited time. So who gets the attention? It's the biggest businesses in town. So, so BRE almost built into a model in which it requires human beings to go out and meet and solve problems, mm -hmm. have to abandon the vast majority of all businesses in your community. So that's well, a problem. By default. Yeah. It'll default. Get and it's no one's fault. It's just that a, a human driven, a labor driven model is difficult to reach a lot of people. Now, I think there's been some really interesting innovations that have happened. Al Alison Larson talked about some of them. There's some great work being done in uh, British Columbia. There's things like industry roundtables and people getting together and helping businesses solve their own problems. Because no matter how good we are as economic developers, we simply can't know every industry. Um, we have to have a high level of competence in the ones that we're, we're specializing in. But these people know their problems better than, than we ever will. There are, there is a large, it seems like there's a movement now away from the survey. There, mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the headlines that came out of a, a conference I recently attended was the business retention and expansion survey must die. Which, <laughs> okay, got it. But I mean, who? another question is, who is that survey for? Mm -hmm. it, oftentimes it's for us, the economic developer, more than it is for helping the business. And I think we need to be focused on the business. There's also whatever is old becomes new again. So the the business walk has become popular. So elected officials and, and staff, they go out in mass into um, commercial corridors and go and physically meet with all those businesses. But guess when that doesn't work? Yeah. <laughs> so we have to do yes when when yeah we know we know when that right. is. Go ahead. So so if you're in lockdown or you're having uh, you need physical distance, people don't want you to come visit them, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of helping businesses by spending personal time with them, face to face time, like no thank you. Everybody is saying no thank you right now. Yeah. So all of these things are the trends. Um, I, I see some innovation happening, but there's still inertia in this. And, and it's because, uh, so it's a longer conversation, but a lot of the education about how to do economic development is incredibly outdated. A lot of education in economic development really should be called the history of economic development and not the present of economic development. I like that. Amen. And, you know, that's, that would be an interesting conversation for another day. Yeah. But you, you've you actually had a role in helping to build the future of economic development, what I really think needs to be the future of economic development. And, and it's the reason why I think it, it fills that role is for one of several reasons is that it changes that dynamic from, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. I can't really do all that much. And I want you to spend your time telling me stuff so that I can go back and do my job, which is kind of been a, a big piece of what's been happening previously. And what I love, and I've been a huge size up fan 
for like since it came out, I think I've actually used it for corridor marketing studies and, um, you know, sort of sort of business uh, retention strategies and and a lot of these kind of things. And what I love about it is that it is granular data to that small business size that, you know, even if you doubled your staff, you couldn't reach that we now realize more than ever how important they are and and it gives them something that they can very practically use they meaning the business owners so you're not just taking and hoping that you can do something but you're actually giving them something of value so i want to make sure that we describe size up i will have links to, to size up in in the materials but i really want to spend the time we have remaining getting deep into or as deep as we can into how size up helps to address many of the challenges that we've just talked about so size up comes actually from some of the learnings that i had when i was doing local economic development and going out and meeting with businesses and doing bre interviews and i just realized like how was i going to get to meet if there were and there were many more, there were thousands of businesses in some of the communities that I serve. How could I get to all of these people? It is just not possible. And it's not my fault. It's not any economic developer's fault. It's just not possible. Um, <clears throat> and how could I provide them insights or tell them something new? And it was an idea that I sat on for a long time. And I got, I got, I had a very nice distraction, which is along the way, I invented another company. I started a company, which I grew and which now the, the software with JS planning is, you know, the, the software is everywhere. But then a special moment happened, which is when cloud computing happened, there was, you could distribute information and services through the internet and big data became something that was more accessible. So what size up does is it provides, it helps economic development organizations better serve their local small and medium sized businesses with market research and business intelligence that these businesses would never have access to. This is the type of information that, uh, you know, if I'm a small business, if, well, let's say, let's say I'm a big business. Let's say that I'm Microsoft or I am Caterpillar or something. I'm going to go hire KPMG or Deloitte or McKinsey or somebody like that to do research for me. But if I'm in a small business, even if they had access to the raw data to make smarter decisions, how would they make sense of it? Well, what size up does is it is both industry specific and hyper local. So that whatever type of business you are, pretty much if you're any normal type of business and wherever you are in the country, you can get information and insights about your business. So, so what we're trying to do is in an automated way, using algorithms and big data and distributing it through the internet is give insights to businesses to tell them things they don't even know about their own business. Like. So, so what does size up do? There are th some specific tools of size up. The first is it provides market and research about a specific industry. So how is my business doing? So benchmarking my performance now, would, would businesses like to know how they perform versus, so if I'm the local architecture firm, would I like to know how I'm performing versus others? That's important. I, I'd just like to know, am I, you know, am I bigger? Am I smaller? Am I in an industry that is growing or I'm in an industry that's declining? Because I, I would make different decisions about the future if I am in an industry that I don't even know is declining. Mm -hmm. I still want to be able to make those decisions. Or am I paying my employees a competitive wage? Or am I overpaying? Uh, all of these types of things are answers that they can get in size up. Another thing that they can do is they can go in and they can use our tools to find new customers, find suppliers. Um, if they find them locally, well, that's great for economic development because of the economic multipliers of doing business and keeping the dollars in the, in the region. <clears throat> Also, they can optimize their advertising, the businesses can, because small businesses, 
many businesses know that they need to do marketing and advertising, but they don't know how to do it. So, but in today's world, if you're doing mass market advertising, it doesn't work. We're not in an era of there's just ABC, CBS, and NBC, and then you can reach everybody. Things are much more targeted. So we give the tools so they can say, in my industry, uh, let's say that I am, um, I'm a dentist, and I want to figure out what are the most underserved markets in my community so I can target them exactly. Well, this is a process which now they can access this information in a matter of minutes. Absolutely. And, and what they, they um, and, and if we didn't have you, you know, in a precarious situation, we might, we might do a, a, a live demo. Maybe we can do that another day. Um, Cause I think, I think people, once they get their hands on it and they really use it, then you can, you say, Oh my God, how did, how did I do it before this? Yeah. Because, <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the, the best the best technology feels like magic. And for what we're seeing with economic developers and with the businesses who are using this technology, it it feels, I, I was actually giving a talk we, we launched in Tucson, right? So there's been a lot of economic development organizations that right now, since they're so focused on small business, they're saying, we need size up, we've got to do this. Tucson was kind of in the process already, but they launched and there was a business on there and they just couldn't believe they're like, this is too good to be true, but it's not because you can do these types of things today because of big data, because of supercomputing. And there's so much information that's out there. Why don't, why don't you unpack a little bit what you mean by big data? Because that's a term that, that folks use a lot of times and people who don't touch tech don't really know much about it, except that it sounds kind of big and creepy. And they may not really understand how powerful that can be. So there's there's lots of different levels of big data. Big data can go from um, medium big to really big. Uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> in this case, uh, I think for, for people who are new to it, they can think about big data as there's lots of different data sets. Some are structured, uh, meaning they're like in columns and rows. Some is unstructured. But there are ways to go out and get this data, normalize it, make it readable by computers, and start to find insights. Basically, to, to find things that you couldn't do. And it also becomes an issue of getting insights that humans could never figure out just because there's just too many computations. I would say that, you know, size up, we're in the, in the medium big uh, data. So we're not dealing with like every single financial transaction or we're not all of those things, but yeah, we are dealing with financial transactions. We're dealing with revenue. We're dealing with issues related to payroll. What we're doing with size up was we're bringing all these data sets together in one place and presenting it in a way that even the most unsophisticated business can make sense of. Excellent. And, and, and just to kind of visualize that and or kind of make that even more concrete, as you said, if you're an architect and you know that you're bringing in, you're bringing in a hundred thousand in gross revenue per year, what Citus Up allows you to do is to look at all of the architecture firms or hairdressers or auto body shops or you know, whatever your industry is within a, your region, whatever you define as your trade area and see that every other hair salon or the, the benchmark, the average the mean of hair, I don't know if it's a mean or a median, but the, the kind of the average of the hair salons in your region are making twice as much revenue as you are. That might indicate to you that you have an untapped opportunity, at which point you can look at the marketing, the um, you know the the demographics of the area, and start asking yourself more intelligent questions about that that can guide you to more intelligent action. Mm -hmm. right. So, so to be clear, size up is industry specific and hyper local. We're not talking about general categories like yes. manufacturing or wholesale. We're talking about 
you know, you are a dentist or you are a pizza restaurant or you are a manufacturer of um, flour. I mean, I don't know. There's, there's just so many industries in there, right? There's so it, it's, it is industry specific, but it's also hyper local. Because if I am in, um, if I'm an engineering firm in uh, Memphis, or I am in, in, uh, in, let's say Sacramento, that may be very different. And what, what I want to do is understand what's going on in my area. I want to know what is happening nationally. I want to know what's happening in the state, but I also want to be as local as possible because comparing uh, Huntsville, Alabama, or Memphis, Tennessee, to Sacramento, to New York, to Miami, these are just different economies. So I want to know what's going on relative to my situation. The other thing is, is it's hyper local, and and we're talking about we're talking about counties or cities or regions. But no, what I'm saying is we're looking at the da- data at the neighborhood level. So what does this mean? It's it's so, so especially if you're in a larger city. So if you're Columbus, Ohio, or you are, so you're Dallas, right? Really a big city. What's happening on the north, south, east, and west side of towns, these are different markets. So we try to be very specific and give insights that are relative to where the businesses are. Okay. And and the extraordinary thing that you, you see is that, you know, this is, as you said, coming down to the neighborhood level which again the part of the reason why i started using it in my work with 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 local communities i actually size up was a core component of a, an economic uh, a market study that i did for a very disadvantaged community in um, in cincinnati uh, uh, for people who know cincinnati it's east price hill and if you looked at any of this information for even the city of Cincinnati, it would have been irrelevant to this neighborhood because of the challenges this neighborhood faces. But by using size up data, we were able to really get deeply into what is it that matters, that works, that is underrepresented, that is an an opportunity in this place. And, and this is an opportunity for economic, yeah. This is an opportunity for economic developers and businesses to enter into the way that modern business is happening. If if you are a successful big business, you are making data driven decisions. Like because the cost of not doing that is too high, the the risk and failure is potentially far too high. So, um, and, and here's the thing: it gets to this issue of scale. With software, with size up, you you as an economic developer, you actually can provide services to all of your businesses and at the times that they need. Think about this. Our offices, when are our office open? So maybe we're open from uh, eight to five. But if you're a small business owner, you're an entrepreneur, what are you doing during that time? You're working. Maybe you don't have time to go down to the economic development office or meet with the score advisor or or the go to the SBDC because you're you're doing work. Well, when you provide online services, now these businesses can get this information at their schedule, which means they can do it in the evenings or the mornings or the weekends. And it's completely scalable because guess what? Servers don't get tired. If you need more computing, you just add more computing, which is something you can't do with economic developers. And I do want to point out that this is additive. This is complementary. This is not... Um, the, that size up is business retention and expansion. It is a component of a series of economic development services that more and more communities are adding. And and why? Because it's just it works. The economics work. The the value. The, um, and and everybody. There is no elected official saying, "Oh, small business doesn't matter." Right. So, so oh, these kittens. Yes. Right. So. So what's happening is, is that, you know, this is a way for, for economic development organization, organizations to show, hey, we're doing things for our local businesses and for the elected officials to point to it and say, hey, we're providing you market research that if you went and you tried to get this, this would cost you, you know, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, but we're giving it to you for free. Yeah, it's, 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 it's um, it addresses so many of the, and I and I sound like I'm shilling, and and I'm not. I don't have any 
any you know paid relationship here. I, there's no check crossing my uh, plate as a result of this. this so, sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. There's no check coming for it. But I appreciate your fond words for size up. No, and 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 you know, I like I said, I've been a fan and a user for a while. Um, you're having to hunch closer and closer, and we're coming up on an hour, so um, I want to I, I want to give you a chance to kind of have some last words and uh, prevent your skin cancer from uh, from developing. Um, and okay. you know, people people with my complexion, you know, I know, I know that's some sun. Why not? Yeah, like well, you know, you. Why you live in California and not get sun? It does seem stupid to me, but you know, hey, I've I've been in Ohio for a long time. Um, so the last thing I wanted to, to I just I just want kind of want to end on this note. Um, a lot of the things that we've talked about, kind of everything from the implementation of new strategies to rethinking how success is defined. A lot of that comes down to questions fundamentally of leadership, of who is who is doing the work, who is who is making the decision to move what we would hope to be in a a forwardly prudent. That's like the worst phrase I think I ever came up with, but it, you know to move it move in a forward direction. Um, so. so as, as we finish up here and tell me anything else you want you want to but what do you think economic development leadership looks like in this context so as the coronavirus pandemic started I was talking you know I talked to a number of economic developers and and there were some who were, who were basically taking a position of oh this is rough I guess we're gonna really have to wait this out and I thought mm. I don't think so. Like, I don't think we can. This yeah. is this might be in all of our lifetimes one of the most significant moments when we need economic developers. Um, our leadership is important at times like this. People are looking to us. Elected officials are looking to us. The our local constituents are looking to us for what do we do to address these issues, and we can actually come up with solutions. There are very real solutions. They may not be the solutions that we had three months ago. In fact, we're seeing, what are some of the trends? We need technology now, right? We need technology to do our work. We need technology to serve our clients. Uh, and, and also, who is our customer? Who is our customer in economic development? This is worth thinking about because I think we just discovered the local businesses are our essential customer. When we talk about, right, essential is a new uh, word that gets used a lot. The essential, yeah. the essential customer of economic development is our local business. And so we've, we've moved in that direction. And why? Because leadership kind of demands that we address what matters most. <clears throat> I'll also say this, and I think this is important for every economic developer to think about, is you, and I know many economic developers may change the communities where they work or things like this, but you are going to be remembered for what you do during this period, personally and professionally. Your, your brand, your, the essence of what people may see about you as coming out of this is what you do today in this coronavirus pandemic, which is having just kind of the worst no, it is empirically the worst economic situation we've seen, right? I, I when we when we were writing, I wrote uh, another white paper that, again that's available on our website at sizeup.com, and we're saying, well, geez, unemployment could get up to ten percent. Like right now, we wish it was only at ten percent. Mm -hmm. So this is just such critical moment and we as economic developers will be remembered by what we do so we can't sit this out there's there's no like okay we'll be on the sideline for this no we need to be on the front line of addressing these issues to help our communities survive these businesses these these workers like this is real stuff and we need to be part of the solution 
um, to help. So, so I think leadership and commitment to, to doing the right thing is really going to matter. All right. There's, there's no words to add after <laughs> that. We definitely want you to get down off of that roof safely. Um, it has given you a glorious background, much better than my ground walls. And I'm so grateful for the time that you've been willing to, to spend with us. Um, you always have the best insight. And then oh, you take that and you, you build up. That's not true, but thank you for saying that. You have, okay, your insight sucks. God, <laughs> like, what the hell? Okay. I, 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 try to, I try to, you know, I just trying to share some of the things that I'm seeing. And also, I just think that we as a profession, we've got to push ourselves. We've got to be better. We've got to start doing new things. We've got to try and start trying new things. So one thing that I guess the, if, if I have a, like a closing thought, it's that um, my some of my friends try to help me in like um, with changing behaviors, like let's all exercise together. Let's change the food that we're eating, things like that. And uh, apparently it takes 21 days to change a habit. Mm. We've been in this shelter in place, lockdown, work from home situation for over 21 days now. And that's a lot of economic developers that are in that situation. Mm -hmm. So what are the habits that we're going to change? What Actually, what are the habits we've already created that there's no going back on? It, actually, if you look at the at the white paper um, that, that we talked about, the national research, um, and, and again, for everybody, it's free. You can download it at sizeup.com. Yep. One of the things that economic developers are realizing is there's a good chunk that are more efficient right now than they were before. Mm -hmm. so they've learned that they can produce better work by working from home. So are we going to go back to working in the office the same amount? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. But what are the other habits? I'm hoping one of the habits is we focus as we are now. We've learned what it is to serve our local and small businesses. So let's keep doing that. It, this is not a bad habit. This is a good habit. So we've learned yeah. how to do it, no matter what our spe uh, our specialty was in economic development. We've all had to learn how do you serve local businesses? How and do we all do BRE? Let's just yeah. keep doing it. And we've all learned just how crucial that is and that piece of the work is to being a good economic developer, being an effective economic developer, and having an effective community. I love what you said a little bit ago, that you will be remembered yes. for what you do now and in the coming months and years. And, so, also, what you, and also what you don't do. And, what right? you don't do. Mm -hmm. so, and, and I think the things that we need to do is we need to reinvent. I mean, the economy is getting reinvented. If economic development doesn't reinvent with it, then we start being not relevant. Yes. And I think that economic development is a good profession and that there's great things that we can do, but not if we keep doing essentially 1930s economic development. There's a lot of that going on. Again, I know it's a different conversation, but we need to change. And I've seen a lot of economic developers do things that they never even thought that they would do before. Uh, I think that's a reason that, you know, my my phone is ringing and my inbox is getting more filled up is because people are realizing they need technology. They need to support local businesses. What are the tools that are out there to do it? And so they like size up. That's great. I'm, I'm happy. We are one of the tools that I think economic developers need to do. And we're one of the programs. So, but I think we need to move also from being, I, I, here's another change that I think is happening is we're moving from being tactical to being more strategic. So we started being very short term, which is what, what is short term? Short term is I get some jobs, I get some capital improvement, like capital investment. Um, and now we're thinking more in terms of equity, sustainability, lifelong learning, entrepreneurship. So economic development is experiencing change. And I'll, I'll tie this back to what we said is, but change happens through leadership and somebody's got to lead forward. If, if you are just following the trends in economic development, your community is disadvantaged, mm -hmm. right? You, you actually have to be comfortable taking risks. Failure's okay. 
right? Like try to fail fast, fail forward. But we need to do different things in economic development today. And that requires leadership. And that's, and that's never easy, but that can be a conversation for another day. Um, yeah, go, go forward and do things that are not easy. I think that's gospel truth at the point. Thank you. Thank you again. You're so welcome. Much. All right. And we're going to turn this off before you attempt to get down. This is what my dad's meetings have to be like now. The coronavirus outbreak right now. Looks kind of dumb, but this is what he has to deal with. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured. We'll revive and we'll prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself.